Hello there everybody, What Culture's Adam Cleary here and you know it, I know it, Newcastle United have signed some mingers in the past. And good news, as part of my court-appointed 100 hours of community service, I now have to talk about that because it qualifies as some kind of therapy. Hooray! No, but in all seriousness though, for every single adored transfer gem that comes into the club under either auspicious or understated circumstances and makes a brilliant name for themselves before eventually signing for Liverpool or Spurs or somebody like that, there is also just one just rotten, lumpy core of molten, can't pass it five yards, just rancid shit, isn't there? They all give it the same thing, don't they? Oh, it's great to be at this famous club. Oh, the fans are the reason I came. Oh, I can't wait, etc., etc. Then they turn out on the pitch and you're just like, how is this man a professional footballer? You've lost count of how many people that applies to. And yes, as the title suggests, I am going to outline now what Newcastle's worst ever starting 11 would be. And the thing is, you could just pull actual starting 11s out of the history books for this, couldn't you? But no, I'm going to combine all the worst players in Newcastle history to come up with something resembling a functional football team of idiots. So without any further ado, and because I've already wasted about 10 hours of my life shortening this list down to 11 people, my name is Adam Cleary and this is Newcastle United's worst ever 11. Number one, goalkeeper, Jack Anik. I feel absolutely terrible about this one because none of this is technically Jack Anik's fault and you have no idea how close he ran Lionel Perez for this spot, but sorry pal, it's you. Newcastle were having a goalkeeping crisis in 2014, and with yet another injury, Jack Annett was called off the bench, where he should probably never have been in the first place, and pressed into action against Chelsea. Now, I remember going to that game, I was at that game, and I remember leaving saying, hey, I tell you what, didn't Jack Annick do his best? Yes, he flapped at that cross, which cost us the game, but he's a young lad, it was his debut, I think other than that, he did really well. Quite excited to see what comes next for him. What came next was in the following five games, he conceded 13 goals, which is admittedly not entirely his fault. Newcastle are minging at times, remember, but still a lot of them kind of were. Now, bless him, he tried his best, but he was just so far out of his depth in the Premier League. The guy had been on loan at Gateshead and had not really done anything since he'd come back from that. He was never supposed to play for Newcastle in the first team, but the circumstances demanded it. He did try his best. God damn, do I respect him for doing that, but I would have tried my best as well and it wouldn't have been very good. And yet, weirdly, I actually thought it was pretty harsh releasing him at the end of that season because, god damn, he tried, man, and how many players have we had who didn't even do that? But regardless, the club took one look at him in those six games and thought, no, no, goodbye, sorry. Number two, defender, Claudio Casapa. Yeah, look, we're just, we're gonna go 3-4-3 here because A, it's 2020, and B, when we started trying to work out who the right back would be in this side, the best we'd come up with was Peter Ramage, and I actually thought Peter Ramage was pretty good. So yes, three centre-backs, because Newcastle just have such a history of absolutely awful centre-backs, and number one is Claudio Casapa. Remember, the uh, got him from Leon, didn't he, where he captained them to league titles. He'd been sought after by Premier League clubs for years, and we finally got him, the Brazil international, and he just fell off the ball every time somebody so much as looked at him. Really embarrassing. Like the guy could clearly play football. He'd evidenced this in France over a number of years, but then just that game against Portsmouth, where like John Utaka was like, Oh, is that you having that ball? I actually think I'll take that myself instead and just score. And then 10 minutes later, he went, Oh, hi again, just me again. I'm just going to take that ball and score. Is that okay? I know it's only the first half, but it's okay if we get the 4 0. Hauled off after 18 minutes in a Premier League game. Now, I know since it's come out, he wasn't really fully fit, etc., etc., but his other performances didn't exactly inspire you with confidence. He has one of the most catastrophic singular performances in a Newcastle shirt, and for that, he is on this list. Actually, slightly funny story. I remember watching Sam Allardyce on Sunday Supplement when he was Newcastle manager, going through a goal we'd conceded and literally going, we worked on that. Kasapa's made it look like we didn't even work on that. I don't know why he's not doing his job. And I just thought, wow, that's a manager just hanging his players out to dry on national television. I'm sure he's not a piece of shit. Number three, Sol Campbell. It's mad this really, isn't it? Because Sol Campbell is undoubtedly one of the greatest English centre-backs of all time. I was going to say of his generation, but probably no of all time, and yet he ends up in Newcastle's worst ever 11 because by the time he got here, he was 
52. It's mad, isn't it? Because when he was at Tottenham, he looked like an absolute game changer for how teams were going to start defending in the future. Then he went to Arsenal, he's one of the greatest players in the world, in one of the greatest sides in the world. Then he even went to Portsmouth and started dragging them up the league single-handedly. And then there was the whole Notts County thing, which nobody ever talks about. And we got him on a free when we got back to the Premier League, having tried to sign him when we went into the Championship. And... It didn't go well. That 4-0 loss at Stoke just, it was a sad sight to see. Like, if Sol Campbell had been a dog, the RSPCA would have come onto the pitch, quietly taken him away from Newcastle at that point. He should not have been playing Premier League football at that age. And yet, we weren't allowed to buy anyone else. Because, Ashley, 73 caps for England. And there was a moment in that Stoke game when Shane Ferguson, Shane Ferguson looked at him and went, mate, what are you doing? Number four, Marcelino. I mean, what do you want me to say here? Six million or something back when six million was a lot of money. The man who was going to fix Newcastle United's defensive woes. He was going to plug that hole that cost them the league a few years prior. And then he played 17 games for the club because he injured his finger or he had a hurty toe or it was raining or he needed a haircut. It was just the most bizarre bizarre transfer. And do you know what it is? I don't want to sound like your dar here because this is one of the laziest, most pointless criticisms you can make of a footballer, but my God. Is he the softest player we've ever bought? Capped five times by Spain, you know. Five times by Spain. A country that produced Carlos Puyol and Gerard Piquet. He got five caps in that same national side. That is insane to me. For years after he left Newcastle, he was RTV, one of Spain's biggest channels, Premier League correspondent because of all the extensive experience he had playing in the Premier League for Newcastle 17 times because his hand hurt. Number five, Silvio Maric. Silvio Maric was the first ever Croatian to play in an FA Cup final. A genuine honour, a dubious distinction, Ruud Hull put him in the Newcastle side to play Manchester United in 1999 and pretty much that is the only notable thing about his entire time on Tyneside. 19 caps for Croatia, which is absolutely not to be sniffed at, but again, not to sound like your dar here, the pace and the power of the Premier League, i.e. how little time you have on the ball and how much running you're expected to do, did not work for Maric at all. He did not have a nice time playing in that side. He did not have a nice time playing in that league. He managed a solitary two years at the club before finally being moved on in 2000. And like pretty much everybody who fails at Newcastle, had a fairly all right career after that. Porto, Dynamo Zagreb, Panathinaikos. And yes, you may sit there and go, well, it's not Newcastle United, is it? And you'd be correct. But the guy played a lot more Champions League than we did after he left. Number six, Steven Island. Hands up who thought this was a fairly inspired dip into the loan market that year. There was a time when Steven Island was at Manchester City where he looked like one of the best, most exciting midfielders in the entire world. He was one of the Premier League's best third man running players. You know, that system where centre midfielders would just turn up late in the box and tap in like 15 goals a season. People couldn't believe they let him go to Aston Villa and yet it didn't work there. But us getting him on loan when we were desperate for goals from midfield looked inspired. Nope. He made two appearances in the entire six months he was on loan here and did less than nothing? Is it possible to do less? If it is possible to do less than nothing, then Steven Island did less than nothing. In fact, the only positive contribution he made in his entire time at Newcastle United was being involved in this photograph with Leon Best, which just, if that doesn't sum up what it's like to be a very average footballer in this country, I don't know what does. Number seven, Ignacio Gonzalez. I don't, I have no idea what I'm supposed to say about Gonzalez. He was the man whose transfer triggered Kevin Keegan walking out on the club, embroiling us in a long running legal battle and a relationship with Mike Ashley, which I'm fair to say has not ever been resolved since. This was the moment we finally realized what our new owner was all about. He put Dennis Wise in above Kevin Keegan, allowed him to sign whoever he wanted as a favor to certain agents and certain mates. And when the manager went, excuse me, I have to actually put this team on a field. Who is this player? He went, oh, just go watch him on YouTube. Imagine that, YouTube. And I mean, not to completely undermine where I make my entire very comfortable living, but YouTube, that, that's, that's your scouting network for an unheard of South American footballer you're supposed to put in your football team. That is a, that is a plot line from Dream Team. And it was actually happening, not only to Newcastle United, but to Kevin Keegan. And the man at the heart of it was the man they call Gonzalez. I'm willing to bet that no matter how much of a diehard Newcastle United fan, I could put five 
different photos of Uruguayan sentiment fielders up right now, and you would not be wholly confident you could tell me who Gonzalez was. I wouldn't be. Do you know what? I didn't even look up what his actual career statistics were. I remember him standing over a free kick at West Ham, and then that was it. He was just never seen or heard from again. Number seven, Albert Luque. Also, hands up who thought this was an inspired little dip into the transfer market that summer, because me, really me. Now, this was back in the day when not everybody had access to European football, and the little clips you saw from Ligue 1 or La Liga or Das Bundesliga were few and far between, but we had all categorically absolutely seen Albert Luque tearing Real Madrid a new arsehole playing for Depo, hadn't we? And it was like, well, players come over from Spain and they sometimes struggle to adapt to the pace and the power of this league, but look at how thick this man's thigh muscles are. He's going to tear it up in the Prem. Nine million pounds, the fee seemed fairly reasonable considering he was going to score bags of gold and we've just got Michael Owen, so we can even play him out wide where he's even better cutting in and doing all this damage. And then... Jesus, God almighty, what happened? Now, I, of course, am very tempted to say that Graham Souness happened, but we must also pay due respect to the horrendous muscle tear he incurred on his debut against Manchester United. A rip, a strain, a pull so bad, it has been equated with being as severe as a double leg break in terms of rehabilitation time, rehabilitation time, rehabilitation time, and what it does to the body. All his pace, all his power, all his finishing ability, he never, ever, ever managed to get that back, except for when two Sunderland defenders ran into each other at the Stadium of Light, lol, and he got through and scored. That was literally it. Number nine, Stefan Givash. Thing is, Stefan Givash undoubtedly had talent. He'd literally just won the World Cup minutes prior to arriving at St. James's Park, and he was this exciting new French player, just as this new, exciting French breed of football was coming in, and we picked up someone from that World Cup squad. This was a good buy. But the thing is, as so often happens in football, this was a Kenny Dalglish signing. He took a little while to get going, and then when Ruth Hullett came in not long after, he just did not fancy him one bit. He relegated him to bit parts in the team. He couldn't quite find a role for himself at the club, and it just never worked out. It was a colossal waste of money. It was a huge disappointment given the expectation put upon him, and he just never quite quite recovered. And while I am happy to say that circumstances obviously didn't help his case, the rare appearances he did make in a Newcastle shirt were, and whisper it now friends, not very good. From here he went to Rangers where he didn't really do a whole lot, then he went back to Auxerre where he did score a record club 69 goals. Nice, but certainly wasn't the ascent to the top of the footballing pyramid we were all hoping it was gonna be. Number 10, Cisco. Dumps like a truck, 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 signed for what, what, what? Where is this random Spanish player come from that you are just putting in my team again? Mr. Wise, you honestly have to be going some to score a goal on your debut and still end up in the worst ever 11, but here we are. And you know what? I'm sure Cisco undoubtedly had talent, and I'm sure all the second division Spanish sides that we loaned him out to loved having him there for a season, but ultimately there have been few transfers at this club work out as disastrously as this one. This was every bit as much of a catalyst for Keegan leaving as Gonzalez was, except that we parted with nearly £6 million for the privilege. I have been repeatedly wrong about Cisco. I actually thought after he scored that goal in his debut, hey, maybe he might be all right then. Just loaned him out straight away. And then we went to the championship. I thought, you know what? He's physically strong. He's a good finisher. He could be the centre forward to fire us back into the league. And no, they loaned him out again. Then when he came back from loan the second time after we got up, I was like, oh, look, he just assisted Andy Carroll at the end of the Villa game. Maybe this is going to be Cisco's year. And just no, it never was. A strange, strange, unhappy tale, thanks to Dennis Wise, who is, let's face it, a strange, strange, unhappy little man. Number 11, Chef Kikuchi. You ever seen the movie Moneyball, right? There's a scene in it where Brad Pitt's baseball team has just lost their star players. And instead of trying to replace like who they are in terms of their personality and all the good things they do, they just go through the numbers and trying to replace them in terms of basic statistics. They just get these average players, but who get on first base a lot, and that somehow fires them to the top of their division. I'm convinced that's what happened with Chef Kikuchi. Alan Pardew watched Moneyball, the movie, sat down and went, we're not going to replace Andy Carroll's goals, but we can replace how many headers he wins. So they did. They got Chef Kikuchi in on a free to fill that aerial hole in the side. And he did absolutely nothing for the club. And I was really annoyed about this because all I wanted to see was his big belly flop goal celebration and he never scored a goal. And the reason for that was because he just couldn't finish, which is absolutely bizarre because he is literally finish. Hey, 
So, there you have it. That is Newcastle United's worst ever 11. Read to you by a man who genuinely, genuinely thinks he could not only get into this side, but probably do a half-decent job. I don't know where. Maybe for Marcelino next time it's, I don't know, a bit cold. Anyway, let me know what you made of it all in the comments below. Of course, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching. I've, of course, been Adam Cleary. This is what culture, I think. And I'll see you soon. Goodbye.